next lesson tonight and of course Wednesday and then next Sunday as the Lord leads us. But tonight we're going to be in the spirit world again. We're going to talk about body, soul, and spirit. That's going to be our emphasis for tonight is body, soul, and spirit. Before we do anything else, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God's blessing on this study. Fathers, we come into your presence tonight. Lord, we just want to count our many blessings. And fathers, the song says, name them one by one. Lord, you've been so good to me this week. And Lord, every day of my life, you're good to me. And I'm thankful for the blessings upon my family. I thank you, Lord, for uh, the wedding this week. I thank you, Lord, that we were able to be a part of that. And Lord, we just ask for your blessing upon uh, our son and his new bride. And we thank you, Lord, for uh, just so many blessings that you've provided for us. Being a part of the service this morning and our soul being stirred by the songs that we've heard. And Lord, the songs that emphasize the blood and emphasize the hope of of salvation in heaven and eternal life with you and Lord all of us have ups and downs and highs and lows and we need that good Christian music to just lift our spirit remind us that there is something better than this life and Father we thank you for our church we thank you Lord for uh, this service even here tonight may you be the center of it Lord I pray that uh, we would study your word may you feed us from it as we study and Lord, all the needs that are in this congregation here and those that are watching with us online tonight, we hear every day of new cases of COVID. We hear every day of those that are in the hospital or out of the hospital or, Lord, have a, a procedures that are approaching. Father, we just pray for your comfort upon them all. Lord, you alone are the great physician, so may you meet their physical and spiritual needs in a way like only you can do. Father, we pray for our fall festival. Lord, we pray that it wouldn't be just a time of fun. Lord, we want that to be part of that night, but not just fun, but may it also be a time where those that are searching for a church family might find that here. Those that are lost may find salvation. Uh, Lord, just help us to reach somebody, and I just pray that you would be exalted and glorified. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Uh, we're going to talk tonight about body, soul, and spirit. And so as I was thinking about this lesson... Uh, and it's one of those lessons that we could spend quite a few weeks in it, so I'm going to try to abbreviate it and condense it down as much as possible, hopefully get it done in one lesson. Uh, but the, the, the whole point of it all is that we are a body, soul, and a spirit. Every one of us tonight, we see our bodies, but we really don't see us. We see part of us, but that's not the real us. You're not really your body. Uh, you're just inside your body. Uh, the real you is more than just the outward shell, the outward flesh, the outward skin. So when you're looking in a mirror and you see yourself, you're not really seeing you. You're seeing part of you. You're seeing the outward you, but you're not really seeing all of you because you are a trinity. God is a trinity. He made man in his image, and he made us as a trinity. One of the greatest examples of that is when God made Adam. It says that he formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. We see that trinity in the formation, the creation of man. He formed man out of the dust of the ground. So that's the body. But the body alone is not all there is to that human being. Adam wasn't just a body. If he was just a body, then he wasn't what God made him to be. There's more to that. Uh, he's a body. He's formed out of the dust of the ground. But God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The breath is the spirit. The soul is the soul. The body is the body. In Adam, we see a body, a soul, and a spirit. That is something that distinguishes us from all other life forms on earth. You know, everybody's trying to find life outside of earth. I've never figured that out. We've got life here on earth that's not even uh, worth anything to this world. Human life isn't worth anything to this world. I mean, uh, 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 this world looks at a, an embryo, a, a, a baby inside the womb, and they said, oh, that's nothing. That's nothing but a bunch of cells and a bunch of tissue. But if there was life like that outside of earth, why, the whole world would be going crazy over it. So they don't really value life. But life, we know, true life comes from God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. He is the life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Life comes from God. The Bible tells us that He came to give us life and life more abundantly. So God is a God of life. But all life doesn't have a trinity, a body, soul, and a spirit. For example, plants have life. 
they're living things but they don't have a soul and a spirit if you killed a carrot that carrot doesn't go anywhere except into your mouth and you know what happens after all of that uh, but that's not it has life it's a living thing and this is where so many in this world again are messed up because they think all life is equal like I said except human life I mean we're in a world where they'll kill a, a, a human being for killing an animal and so they value the animal's life over a human being life uh, there's people that will kill someone over a tree they think the tree's life is not even equal to human life they think it's more valuable than human life and God never designed it in that way a tree's life is not equal to a human life and an animal's life I know some of y'all gonna get upset but I got to tell you what the Bible says we all have our pets we all love Fifi -fee and Foo Foo and all of them and you know little Rex and all of that and uh, but I tell you what the Bible says that God made man in his image he didn't make plants in his image he didn't make fish in his image. He didn't make the beasts of the field in his image. He didn't make uh, trees in his image. He made you and I in his image. And so we have life in us, just like plant life and animals have life, but animals don't have the same spirit and soul that a human being has. We know that throughout the Bible. That it's emphasized in both Testaments, but here's a great example of it in Ecclesiastes 3.21 where it says, Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? They go in two different places. Again, I don't want to hurt your feelings tonight and get you mad at me, uh, but uh, everybody wants to know, do animals, you know, do all dogs go to heaven and all of that? But the Bible makes it clear that animals, that's the beast, are not equal to man. They're not made in the image of God, and their spirit is not the same as a human spirit. Ours go up, theirs doesn't. And I'll, I won't say any more about that because y'all are going to start throwing things at me for talking about, I just know that my dog or my cat and my pet squirrel or my pet rabbit's there. Uh, but uh, the Bible tells us that they're made differently than we are. Adam's made in the garden. And Adam, let me ask you tonight, was he just a physical being in the garden? Or was he a spiritual being? He's actually both. He had a physical body. He had a physical body, but they were living in a physical world that they saw things and viewed things and understood things in a spiritual way. It wasn't until the fall of man that they saw themselves naked. The Bible says before that they were naked and not ashamed. Well, that's a lot more than you can say about this generation, amen? Uh, and so they were naked and not ashamed. And now they fell and all of a sudden they were still in the garden, but now they're not viewing things spiritually. They're viewing things physically in a fallen world. Paul goes into great detail about this in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 15. If you want to study that, look in 1 Corinthians 15 from verse 1 to the end of the chapter. The end of it deals with the translation from the physical world to the spiritual world and the rapture of the church. But the first half of it, about first three quarters of 1 Corinthians 15, as he's talking about, there's a natural man and there is a spiritual man. Now when he says man, he's talking about mankind, all humanity. He says there is a natural, that's what we see us tonight. We're seeing the natural. We're in a natural world. There's the natural, but there's the spiritual. And right now we have to live in the natural world, but there, that doesn't mean that's all there is to us. We are still spiritual beings, even though we're in a natural world. Our natural body and our spiritual body are composed of some sort of matter. We know physically we are, but even spiritually we are. You just can't see it and touch it and feel it. And the natural body is adapted to the physical environment, the physical world around us, and is limited to the laws of nature and the laws of physics. For example, gravity, it's a law. That's what they call it, it's a law. Newton's law of gravity. And so if you push somebody out of an airplane at 35,000 feet, that law dictates that they're going to fall. There's nothing they can do to stop that. Now, if they had a parachute, they can break that law or they can kind of uh, uh, temporarily uh, uh, alter that law, but that law is always going to be in effect. Gravity is always going to affect this planet until the rapture. And in the rapture, gravity will have no effect on us. Amen? And so we're going to be absent from our body and present with the Lord. I'll talk about that here in a minute. But the body would fall from the plane. and You know what would happen next? That's a law. But the body would be destroyed, but the soul wouldn't be destroyed. 
the spirit wouldn't be destroyed because you can't destroy the spirit. You can't destroy the soul. Only the body can be destroyed. I'll, I'll mention that here in a little bit if, if uh, I have time and time permits me. But one of the greatest examples of all of this, the body, soul, and the spirit, is the tabernacle. And Katerina can zoom in on here. That's why I put it up here so she can do it with the camera. But, uh, but the tabernacle, and the Bible great, gives us great illustrations of the Trinity all through it. But the tabernacle is primarily a tent. That's all it was, it's just a tent. It was a dirty, probably smelly tent, to be honest with you. Made out of animal fur, animal hides, and skins, and all of that. Out there in the desert, the dust, being carried back and forth, being packed up and moved and set up. And I mean, it's out there in the rain, it's out there in the sun, and all of that, but it's just a tent. In fact, it's a tent inside of a tent. Here's the outward tent. The tabernacle, the curtain's going around it, but inside is also a tent. So there's a tabernacle and a tabernacle. And over here you have what's called the outer court. And the outer court, all of those that were camped around the tabernacle were forbidden to come inside the tabernacle, except the priest, the Levitical priest. You've got an outer court, but then inside this area is a holy place. The tabernacle had an outside, it had the outer court, it had a holy place, and in here is the most holy. You know, all things that are holy aren't even equal. Some things are more holy than others. And in fact, you'll see that in the, in the Old Testament, in the Levitical law, God, uh, He distinguishes between holy and most holy and unholy. Hard for us to understand, but that's how God designed it. And so the tabernacle was primarily a trinity with an outer court. This outer court out here, you had a brazen uh, 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 altar. Uh, you had a brazen laver uh, that had the water in it. And inside here, if you remember our study on the tabernacle, you had a table of shoe bread. It had uh, 12 loaves of bread on it. Uh, there was an altar uh, of incense that was in here. And there was also a candlestick, a, a, a seven-pronged candlestick. Inside the holy place was the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Testimony. And the dividing veil is what separated the holy from the most holy. And so we see a trinity just in the tabernacle alone. The tabernacle, as I said, is primarily composed of the outer court, the holy place, and the most holy place. The tabernacle was basically a tent within a tent, and the holy place contained the table of showbread, as we said, the candlestick, these golden pieces of furniture, but the veil is the divider between the holy and the most holy. That's what separated from the most holy and the holy, just like your body from your soul. It, there is a veil. And this gets a little deep, so I won't get into much detail about it tonight, but uh, the Bible speaks about circumcision, obviously, in the covenant with Abraham and his descendants. But he also talks about a surgical procedure, a surgical spiritual circumcision of your flesh to your soul and your spirit. And we can't see it. It's made without hands. It's made by God. And God, it's almost like our body and our soul and our, our spirit are, are connected as we're lost, but once we get saved, it's like there is a dividing between the soul and the spirit and the flesh. And now the soul and the spirit still dwells in our flesh, but God has surgically separated it. We can't see it, but it took place because of the blood. It took place because of Calvary. And now we are saved, and we have a saved soul, a saved spirit, and a body that's still fallen. Now, if you doubt what I'm telling you tonight... If we got saved and got our glorified body the moment we got saved, we wouldn't be aging. We wouldn't get hungry. We wouldn't need to sleep. We wouldn't get tired. We wouldn't need rest. We wouldn't need to bathe. We wouldn't need deodorant, and brush our teeth and hairspray and all that fun stuff, right? Our body is still that lost body. But our soul and our spirit saved. So where's our body? We have to live in it. It's like a tabernacle, we're living in it, but one day we're going to get a new body. Now, we're not going to get a new soul and a new spirit because that's already been saved and redeemed, and now we've got a, a transformed soul and spirit that's saved, but we still live in a body that is bound to matter and is bound to the laws of nature and everything else. Now, the courtyard could represent our body. That could be our body. 
The holy place could be our soul, and the most holy place could be our spirit, if you think about it like that. God took up residence on the Ark of the Covenant in the form of the Shekinah glory of God. Now think about this, the, the tabernacle was nothing but a dirty old tabernacle until the presence of God came in it. Once the presence of God is in it, it's not just a dirty old smelly old tent. Now it has the presence of God abiding in it. But the presence of God would come and go. So they, he might dwell there one day, he might dwell there six months, he might dwell there a year, if you read the Old Testament, before the, the, the Shekinah glory would move and the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire would depart, and they'd follow it, it could be there, but then it would leave. But here's what happened when we got saved. That veil has now that was separating us from the presence of God and the Spirit of God is no longer separating it because now we have the Holy Spirit, the Shekinah glory of God dwelling within our earthly tabernacle, and praise God, it's permanent it's permanent I don't pray every day God give me your Holy Spirit I've already got it now I pray that I be filled with the Spirit and led by the Spirit and all of those things but I have it you have it tonight if you're saved like your body without Christ the tabernacle was nothing without the presence of God when the Spirit of God descended in the most holy place the tabernacle truly became alive don't you know it was alive when they saw it I mean, that tabernacle just sat there, but all of a sudden, I can't even imagine. There's no movie. There's no painting. I mean, I look for graphics, things. Nothing can depict what that must have been like to see the presence of God, the form of that fire and the cloud just come down upon that tent and upon that tabernacle, and it became alive. And the Bible says before we got saved, we were alive and yet still dead. Isn't that weird? The Bible says we were dead until we were born again that means your heart can be beating blood circulating through your body your nervous system i mean all those systems in your body are functioning and working and you got two eyes and two ears and a mouth and two feet and two hands and all of that and you you're just as alive as anybody alive you've ever seen but in god's sight you're dead you're like an old tent but when the presence of god comes in you then you begin to live the Bible teaches us this uh, in many places. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1 and verse 4, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, he calls us a tabernacle. We have a building of God. That's our heavenly home. That's our new body. A house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. Verse 4, For we that are in this tabernacle do groan. That's Romans chapter 8. We're groaning, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality. That's what we have tonight. We're mortals with an immortal soul and an immortal spirit, but we have a mortal body. But that mortality is going to be swallowed up of life. That's 1 Corinthians 15. When we, we put off the natural man, we put off the physical, the earthly, and we put on the spiritual and the immortal and the supernatural that God's prepared for us. 2 Peter 1.13 says, Yeah, and I think it meet as long as I'm in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Over and over again, he says, Our body is like a tabernacle. So we go to the tabernacle. That, that tells me tonight, that's a whole other lesson, but there's a lot more to that tabernacle than just a bunch of old furniture, furniture that's covered in brass or gold. It has something to do with how God designed us. And in fact, the Bible tells us that it is a pattern of the heavenly tabernacle. And so there's so much more to it. We read that stuff and we think, why did God care about what color tents were and uh, how many uh, loops and how many couplings and how many selvages and the couplings and all these things? And, and why did we need to know the color of the coverings and all? It all has spiritual meaning and application. And he compares it to us. Now, when a person dies, our soul and our spirit are now going to be separated from our body, our physical mortal flesh, but the spirit of that person is not bodiless. Our soul it has a soulish body. And I don't, I, don't, I don't profess to understand all of this. I just profess to believe it. And one of the greatest examples of this tonight would be a peach. I know you all love my artwork. Look at my peach up here. And uh, I mean, there's many examples I could give you tonight, but, but we'll, we'll do a, a, a peach, I guess, more than anything. And inside that peach, 
Don't that just look just like a peach? You know what? If I painted like this, it'd be worth millions of dollars right now. You ever notice artists? I mean, none of that stuff. I have to look at it this way and that way. And remember those, those pictures that you had to stare at it and, uh, and kind of unfocus your eyes and you could see like a 3D image in it? I look at art today and I think, what is that stuff worth? It's nothing. But they love it, you know. And inside that peach, you've you got three parts in here. Uh, primarily three parts. You've got outside, you've got the skin. Inside the skin is called the flesh. That's what even the world calls this stuff. This ain't Christian terminology. And inside the flesh, you've got a core, or they call it a, a stone or a pit. Sometimes it's called a stone. Now, if uh, I've got a little illustration here, go back to this illustration, Katerina. And uh, if you look at this illustration, this is off of the geochembio.com. I mean, this, is, this isn't Christian stuff. This is what they would even tell you if you cut it and slice it. You've got the skin on the outside. Isn't it strange they call it skin? And you've got the meat. That's the good stuff. I'll tell you, a, a peach, you know it's good when the juice is running down your arm like this. See, when you got a beard, it just runs down your beard. and You save that for later. And uh, you got the flesh, and you got the skin, and you got the stone inside. And, and now, what part of that's the peach? All of it's the peach. All of it's the peach, but it's three parts in one. It's a trinity. It's one thing. It's a peach, three parts. And yet, outside, if this thing rotted... And all the skin rotted and the flesh, if you put it on the ground, if you buried it, it's going to die. But there's life in here. Inside here is life. And in fact, with all the advancements in technology and science and all of that, they cannot reproduce seeds that have life in them. They can break down the components of it. They can break down the chemical structures of it. They can break down all this information. They can put it in a laboratory. They even call this the life principle. And the life principle is that they can replicate and duplicate. It can look identical to the seed, but you put it in the ground and it does nothing because there's something in here that's life that they can't explain, but we can. God gave life to this world. God breathed life into all of this. And so there is life abiding in fruit and in trees and all these things. But it's a picture of your flesh and your soul. Paul pictures it that same way in 1 Corinthians 15. He said that we sow our body. You know, the old timers used to talk about when they bury someone, they'd say they planted them. You ever heard that before? They planted them? We planted grandpa. We planted grandma. What do you do? You put them under the ground. You bury them. But just like a plant, you know that they're not going to stay there. Their body may be in that ground, but that's not where their soul and their spirit is if they're saved. It's in the presence of the Lord. But eventually, even that body, it, they're going to come up out of that ground. They're going to be resurrected. That's the resurrection of the dead in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And they're going to, that's why they're coming up first. And then we which are alive remain shall be caught up to meet them in the air. Now, a great example of our soul and our spirit after we die is found in Luke chapter 16. And I want you to turn there tonight, Luke chapter 16. I didn't put all the scriptures up there. I can't make it too easy on you. Luke chapter 16. You all know the story. It's the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man in hell. And most of the study Bibles nowadays will say the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. This is not a parable. Uh, I know that there are smart people, I guess, that, that put all this stuff, headings and all that, but listen, it's not a parable. A parable is an analogy. It's a story, but it's not factual. And so it can be fictitious characters and in those parables. Uh, but when Jesus said there was a certain man, there was a certain man. It's an account. It's history. It happened. When he gives names, you know that it's not just a parable. If he said there was a man and that was it, but when he goes on and even tells you the names of some of these, you know this, this is an actual event. I believe that as much as I believe John 3.16 tonight. 
Verse number 19, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen. So he's, that's his flesh, that's his body. He fared sumptuously every day. That's in his physical life. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. In his body, he had sores. He's diseased. He has sickness in his flesh, in his body, but he's still alive. And desiring to be fed, his body needs food. Whether you're sick or not, you need food to live. And, and, and uh, desiring to be fed with crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And I've, I've read commentaries and stuff on this that talk about how uh, the dog licking the sores would be almost like uh, a painkiller. It, it'd be a, a, a comfort to him. He's so miserable from the sores and all that he's feeling. Verse number 22, and it came to pass the beggar died. So they're no longer alive, they're dead, and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. So they went from life to death, the physical to now they're in the spiritual world. But they didn't go the same place. And in hell, the rich man, he lift up his eyes being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom and cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. And as I read this tonight, I want you to remember, he's still crying the same thing. He's down there. He still has never got an answer to that request. He's still thirsty. He's still tormented. Verse 25, But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime, that's his physical life, receivedest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fix, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. And then he said, I pray thee. You know, there's prayers in hell that will never be heard. People don't believe in prayer on this earth. You'll be praying in hell if you're not saved, but your prayer will go unanswered. Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they come in this place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. That's the Old Testament. Let them hear them. Basically, he's saying, Let them read the word of God, hear the word of God. That should be enough. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. No, they won't. Say, so how do you know that? Jesus rose from the dead. They still don't repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. This is a story about life and death. Now, this is before the cross. This is before uh, Jesus shedding his blood. He, this is still under the Old Testament laws and things of that nature. And so this man didn't wind up in hell just because he was rich or just because he was uh, uh, you know, mean and a jerk and all of that. And the, the poor man didn't wind up in heaven just because he's poor. So people nowadays have this idea. They think, well, if I'm a good person, I'll make it to heaven. If I'm a bad person, I'll make it to hell. And even then, only hell is reserved really for the severely horrible. I mean, like, like the, you know, uh, uh, maybe those Osama bin Ladens and maybe the Hitlers and people like that. that. That's where hell is, but not for anybody else, right? So this is before the cross. But he's telling us the story of this man. And he tells us that these two people lived and these pe two people died and these two people went to two different places after they died. And he is now, the rich man is in a spirit world. It's still made up of physical things. There are physical flames there. There's physical darkness there. He's in a physical place. But he is not just in his physical body. His body, the Bible says, was buried. So it's his soul and his spirit are the ones communicating and speaking and talking and feeling and sensing and all those things that were there. And the same is true of the poor man, that poor man, the beggar man, Lazarus, he was in Abraham's bosom, but he was buried, but the angels carried him there. So he's also enjoying paradise, but not in a physical body. It's his soul and his spirit. Is there. So they're in disembodied states, yet they're still retaining their consciousness. And I don't have time to get into all of that, I don't think, tonight. But here's what you will see. Your spiritual body, your, your soul and your spirit are so closely connected to your physical body that they resemble one another. Let me give you an example. When Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, they saw Moses and Elijah. 
Yet Moses' body was buried 1,500 years before that. How did they see Moses and they recognize him as Moses? That wasn't Moses' body. That's still Moses, though. And yet they said they didn't have cameras. They didn't have the Internet. They couldn't go and check on his Facebook page and see what Moses looked like. But they said, there's Moses. There's Elijah. And you see that in a lot of examples. That's one of those questions, will we know each other in heaven? And the answer is yes, we will recognize each other. We'll be known even as also we're known. Even though we won't be in a physical body, we'll still be able to see one another and, and know it's one another and recognize one another. And our spiritual body still has the same senses that our physical body has. How do I know that? Well, there's, again, lots of examples, but this story alone here would be sufficient enough. This man had all of his five senses, and yet he's not in a physical body. Look at what it says here. It tells us of this man. It says that in hell he lifted up his what? His eyes, right? But his eyes were buried with his body somewhere. So that means that your soul has eyes. That's how closely connected it is. Uh, in his eyes, and he is being in, he's in torments. Well, that's, that's pain. So your soul can experience pain. He's in torments. In fact, it says, it, it mentions uh, torments and tormented and, 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 uh, and all of that over and over again in this story here. He seeth, he's talking, he's, he recognizes Abraham. He's got memory. He's got consciousness. He's crying in verse 24. He's praying. Uh, he wants water. He desires uh, water. Uh, I mean, he, he remembers his brothers that, that are back on earth. He's got all the same sensations that he had on earth. But what a terrifying thought tonight. In hell, they have those same sensations and never get any relief. How many of you have ever experienced severe pain in this life? I figured every hand was going to go up. Well, y'all are blessed, the ones that couldn't raise their hand. I tell you what, you pass a kidney stone, you know pain. <laughs> Aluna don't like me to say it, but even my female doctor told me, she said that she, listen, I'm going to hear it when I go home, but she said that a man having a kidney stone is just as bad as a woman giving childbirth. So, uh, so I, I've, I've, I'm going to start naming my kidney stones is what I'm going to do. I told my, the last one I passed, I told the doctor, I said, I want to keep it and turn, I'm going to turn it into a, a, a tie tack or something. I said, as much pain as I had to go through to, to deliver that stone, I'm going to make something out of it. But you know, you have a toothache or a broken bone, or I, I don't know if you've ever had migraines before. I've had horrible migraines. I mean, people have been in accidents, things of that nature. You've experienced severe pain. But the good news is, is there always comes a time where the pain goes away. And it's strange. You don't appreciate not feeling pain until you feel pain. Most of us don't say, God, thank you. I made it today and didn't feel any pain today. Didn't have a toothache. Didn't stub my toe. Didn't pass a stone. Didn't do all this stuff. You don't thank God, but I tell you what, you start hurting. You're going to say, God, help me. God, help me. God, get me through it. Oh, I, I wish I was like I was yesterday and the day before and didn't have this pain. But typically the pain ends. Think about this. In hell, the pain never ends. It never goes away. It never stops. There's never a break. There's never a time out. There's never a half time. There's not an intermission. And in fact, the Bible tells us that there's coming a resurrection of the dead, that hell is going to give up the dead that are in it. They're going to stand before the great white throne judgment, and they're going to be cast in the lake of fire. They're going to be resurrected to die again to a worse place than hell. I can't imagine something worse than hell, but the lake of fire is not hell. It's worse. The rich man in hell, he can see and hear and feel and thirst and remember and talk and desire and so much more. And so we see that there's no such thing as soul sleep in the Bible. You're either buried and in heaven or buried and in hell or raptured and in heaven. But there's no in between. There's no purgatory. There's no intermediate state. This man died and was buried and carried uh, to Abraham's bosom. The other man died and is buried and he's in hell instantly we're one breath from the physical to the spiritual one heartbeat from the physical to the spiritual now all my little 
examples up here. I've showed you some of this before, but it's uh, another, well, that ain't going to work. But um, another one's the football. I mean, a football, boy, that's a beautiful football. Did the Panthers win today? Change the subject. Inside that, that, that's one football. Out there today, what was the score? Anybody remember? Oh, my goodness. Wow. There's a time I never missed a Panther game. But anyway, they're throwing around a football out there, kicking a football, punting a football, kicking a field goal with the football. They call it the football. People making millions of dollars to catch the football or to drop the football or to fumble the football. It's a football, but it's a trinity. That football is not just one thing. It's made up of three things. It's got the outside hide. It used to be called a pigskin. And I'm sure it's not leather and pigskin anymore, probably. But, uh, but it's got the outside. Then it has an inner tube inside it that's shaped just like the, the outside. And so that rubber inner tube has something else inside of it that has air in it. So it's got the outside, it's got the inner tube, and it's got air. It's got three parts, primarily three parts in order for that football to go through the air, to be carried, to be thrown, to be passed, whatever. It's a trinity, and yet it's one thing, but it's three. And you see, I'm not up here saying tonight that the trinity is just so simple and easy to understand, but I am saying this. God has given us examples, and they're all through nature. We see it in the sun, the type of rays. The sun has three types of rays. Scientists tell us that those rays are rays that can be seen, rays that can be felt but not seen, and rays that can either be felt nor seen. Three different types of rays, and yet it's one sun. The earth is a core and a mantle and a crust. I mean, it's all through it. There's an earth, there's a moon, there's a sun. The Trinity is all around us, and we accept it, we use it, we, we look at it, we believe it, and then we say we don't understand how we can be a spiritual being and a physical being. We are because we're made in the image of God. I've known people before, maybe you have too, that's lost a limb. I had a teacher in high school. She had lost her legs to diabetes. She was in a wheelchair and, uh, she, and she'd often ha had, uh, she'd reach down in the middle of class to scratch her leg or her foot and it's not there. She'd laugh about it. You ever known anybody to do that? She said, I, I feel my foot itching and she'd reach down to scratch her foot. She didn't have a foot. I've got a feeling, and I can't prove it tonight, but I've got a feeling that your soul is kind of like that inner tube inside of a football. It's so connected, so resembles your physical body that that's why even when a limb, the flesh is removed, people still feel supernatural sensations like it's still there. You say, oh, it's just nerve impulses and neurons and all of that in your brain that's just going off because it doesn't know what else to do with it. I think, and I know the Bible teaches this, we are a body, soul, and a spirit, so even when the flesh may not be there the soul and the spirit still there but you know when we die when something happens to us and we're not here on this earth 2 Corinthians 5 verse 6 says this therefore we are always confident that's assurance that's something we shouldn't guess at we should know knowing that whilst we are at home in the body that's us tonight we are absent from the Lord he's dwelling in us but I can't see him physically tonight People going around saying, I saw God, I saw God. No, they didn't. People lie. No, you, you ate pizza too late at night or something. You didn't. The Bible says no man has seen God at any time and lived. Either the Bible's true or it isn't. Moses, there ain't anybody you've ever met in your life that was as spiritual as Moses was, and Moses couldn't even see God. He could only see the back parts of God and covered with the hand of God. And you're going to tell me you're more spiritual than Moses? God wouldn't even let Moses see him, but he let you? I don't buy it. We're in the body. We're absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. I can't see God tonight, but I believe he's real. That's faith. I can't see heaven tonight, but I believe it's real. That's faith. I can't, I, I, I can't see my home there that he's gone to prepare for me, but I believe it. That's faith. Verse 8, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. 
You see that tonight? It is an instantaneous thing. When you're absent from your body, you're not sleeping. You're not drifting around. You're not Casper the friendly ghost in a white sheet just going around. You're not opening your loved one's cabinets and knocking their bread off the shelf. <coughs> you're with the Lord. <clears throat> I hear people say, I got to tickle my throat. <clears> throat. I hear people say that all the time. They'll say, Should I even say this tonight? Y'all are probably upset with me over the animal thing. So, But uh, I know a lady, her, her, I believe it was her sister, had passed away, and her sister's favorite color was red. And she said, uh, She kept saying, if, if, uh, if you can hear me, I just want a sign that you're okay. And she says she's driving down the highway and a red balloon she saw floating in the sky. And she said, when I saw that red balloon, I just knew it was my sister saying, I'm okay. I know y'all think I'm just being mean, but you know what I would have thought? Some kid let go of their balloon. Poor kid. <laughs> you can read into anything you want to read into. If you know your loved one's saved, what do you need a red balloon for? I don't need a red balloon. I know another lady, she said uh, it was something to do with a bird or something. And uh, she said the bird came flying in her yard. And, it was, uh, and she said, I just knew when I saw that bird there that it was, it was my loved one telling me I'm okay. Folks, here's how it works. They're not floating around holding balloons in their hands and taking on the form of birds and all of that. And they just reincarnate to an animal to come in your yard to look at you and tell you they're okay. Either you're in the body and absent from the Lord or you're absent from the body and present with the Lord. That's it. There ain't nothing else. There ain't anything in between. We are presently, we have the Lord with us, but we're absent from Him, but we have confidence. It's our faith that when we're absent from our body, we will be present with the Lord. I don't have to worry about going through purgatory and enduring torments and, and for all of my wrongs and sins for hundreds and hundreds of years and hoping that some of my relatives love me enough to go and make penance for me and to uh, give money to the priest so that I might shorten my 5,000 years stay in purgatory to five you know, to, to 2,000 years stay and eventually I get out. Either you're with the Lord or you're not. According to the Bible. That ain't Baptist teaching, that's Bible teaching. I, I remember when limbo was being taught by the Catholic Church. Now again, you say stuff like this and people get upset and say, you're making fun of the Catholics. I ain't making fun of any Catholics. I'm just telling you what, what they believe. And limbo is not the game with the stick and you try to get under it. Limbo is where little children and unborn or, or, or babies that died at birth or miscarriages had to go somewhere. So the Catholic Church couldn't figure out, where well, are they in heaven? What happened to them? So they invented this place called Limbo, which is a place where they could go. It's like a glorified nursery land where they grow up. Got little angels taking care of them and feeding them and you know, raising them and teaching them to walk and all of that kind of thing. And eventually, like graduating from you know, uh, you know, kindergarten or something, they eventually graduate from that and make it to purgatory. Wow, what an upgrade. And from there, maybe they can make it to heaven or something. And uh, it wasn't this pope. I think it was the one before him, Pope Benedict or whatever, he came out, and because the Pope can speak what's called ex cathedra, he could, he's the vicar of Christ, according to them. That means that he is Christ's representative. He's the closest thing to Jesus Christ on this earth. He thinks he is Jesus Christ. And he said, I declare that limbo, look it up. I'm not just making this stuff up. He declared limbo no longer existed. And everybody said, oh, the Pope said limbo doesn't exist. The Pope hath spoken. And I thought to myself, wait a second, then what happened to all those babies? What happened to all those little kids? So for hundreds of years, they're believing that these babies, so I guess the Pope just said, hey, it's closed now, closed shop. Sorry. And bless people's heart, they buy that stuff. They believe it. If, if my faith was in a man that could just say, hey, this compartment's open, this compartment's closed, bless the hearts, we ought to pray for them. You're absent from your body and present with the Lord. Here, Luke chapter 23, 43, Jesus is on the cross, the penitent thief that's there. Jesus said unto him, Verily I said unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. We were eating breakfast yesterday, and a man at the table, he's talking to me, and he said, uh, he said that he's saved, but he grew up as a Jehovah's Witness. And he said, I think it was like 2006 or something like that is when he got saved. 
And he said uh, it's been one of the hardest things for him to witness to his family. And he said part of the hard part is he said, because I don't know if you knew this or not, but the Jehovah's Witness got so tired uh, of, of people like us that would give them scriptures to combat what they taught that they came up with their own Bible translation. And conveniently, all the areas that Christians would actually challenge them on, you go to those places and they've changed it to mean something else, to fit their belief system. This is one of those places. I asked him about it yesterday. And, uh, and uh, the New World Translation is what they call it. And in the New World Translation, some of you think that a word here or there doesn't make any difference. Let me show you that even punctuation makes difference, makes a huge difference. It's just the thoughts, Brother Ben, of the Bible that really matter. No, it's the words. God said, my words, add thou not to my words. But look at the punctuation. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, comma, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. You know what that means? That's one of the greatest examples for us in the New Testament that when we die, we're in the presence of the Lord if we're believers. Jehovah's Witness don't like that because they don't believe that you can go to heaven after you die. So they took that comma and they moved it. And the way they've moved it, and I forget exactly, I have to look, and I've got one on my shelf in there, but they moved it so that it's not Jesus saying today, this day you're going to be with me in paradise. Jesus is speaking to him that day. So like I would say, I'm speaking Sunday. Jesus is saying, he's talking to him that day, thou shalt be with me in paradise, but not today, but you will be, but it's just not, does that make sense? They change it. You say, well, what's the difference? There's a huge difference. Jesus promised that thief, I'm going to see you today. And I believe Jesus kept his word. I believe once Jesus died, he saw that thief. That thief was converted on the cross. A great example of deathbed salvations are possible. Even though there's only one example, so I wouldn't count on, you know, everybody says, well, I'll wait till I die, and then I'll make it right. There's only one deathbed salvation in all the Bible, and he happened to die next to Jesus Christ. I wouldn't take my chances tonight. But that man died and Jesus said, I'll see you in paradise today. I believe when Jesus died, he saw him and kept that promise. But they moved that so that it didn't say today he, Jesus would see him in paradise. Jesus was just talking to him that day. But here's an example again. Paul says we're absent from the body, confident and present with the Lord. And here Jesus says, you're going to be with me today. That's at the moment of death. That means there's no gap in between the physical life and the spiritual life. The spiritual life begins at conception and never really ends. Think about that. Our physical life can end. My life could end tonight. I hope it doesn't. But if it ended tonight, I still didn't die. My body died. I'm just as much as alive as I've ever been. In fact, I'll be more alive than I ever was. The real life is not this one. This is just this temporary inconvenience till we get to where we're actually going. I saw this picture today and I thought it was really neat. I don't know if you can see it or not, but it's a casket. And that casket from there, you're straight in the presence of the Lord. I don't even think it's when you get in the casket. I think it's the moment you go, oh, it's your last breath. I believe instantly, quicker than you could snap your fingers, you're in the presence of the Lord. Can you imagine that tonight? In the presence of the Lord, instantaneous, no gap in between. So you never really stop living. You never really die. You just put off this mortal flesh. And that's why those like Paul that actually got to see, and I didn't get, it, get into this tonight. We'll have to save it for the next lesson. But Paul got to see the third heaven. He got to see the throne of God. And when he saw it and came back, do you think that he wanted to stay down here? He said, I've got a desire to part to be with Christ. He said, but God's will right now is for me to be down here. But he said, once you saw what he saw, do you think any of this? I mean, people live in their whole world for this. This is it. I mean, cars are going to break down and toilets are going to back up and wash machines that ain't going to work and a house that's going to leak and uh, I mean sickness and pain and separation and problems and work issues and stresses and anxiety this is what you're living for there's something so much better 
And in fact, when Paul saw it, he come back and he said, I can't even put it into words. It ain't lawful for me to utter what I saw up there. I guess we'd say today, you wouldn't believe me even if I told you. If he had to put it down in the Word of God, we'd say, I doubt it. There ain't no way. There's no way. My mom's mom, I've told you this before, but my mom's mom, my grandma Raider, when she was dying, she said she could see flowers in heaven. She kept telling my mom and her family, she kept saying, can't you see the flowers? You just had to know my grandma Raider. She could recognize every bush, every tree, every flower. I mean, there's an app now on your phone that can do this where you can hold it up to a tree and tell you what kind of tree it is and hold it at a flower. You've seen this? My, my grandma was that app in physical form. Grandma, what is that plant? She could tell you all about it. And she said, I can see flowers. She said, they're, they're crystal clear. She said, you can see straight through them. And the colors she was describing, she said she couldn't understand that they couldn't see them. And she was just mesmerized on her deathbed by the flowers and the colors she was seeing in heaven. You say, oh, Brother Ben, that's just medication. And that's just when the body, and I heard a nurse talk about this, that when the body, uh, you know, uh, is dying, that you begin to hallucinate. No. I think at that moment, the spirit world and the physical world are coming so closely connected that you're seeing into a world that we can't even begin to believe until we're going to see it for ourselves. The Bible says the streets of gold are like glass. Have you ever seen gold? Don't look like glass. But up there, it's going to look like glass. Walls of jasper, gates of pearl, I mean, all of that. That's the spirit world. But we're in the spirit world now. But we're in a physical body, so we can't see it. And that's going to bring us up to our next lesson. I thought I'd get through it tonight, but I didn't. And we're going to talk about this. This is one of the best diagrams I've seen. This goes back to uh, the early uh, 1900s. But uh, a great man by the name of Clarence Larkin, who was an architect, was saved and used his talent to draw charts and all of that. Anybody you've ever studied prof with prophecy? Tim LaHaye. I mean, uh, I mean, you go down the list, John Hagee, you name them, they've all used Larkin's charts. They all study it. Larkin, uh, and many of them don't even give him credit, but Larkin designed this, and, and I don't agree with every single thing, but here's a great illustration of three concentric circles, concentric circles, the body, the soul, and the spirit. The body, in Greek, the soma, the psyche, and the pneuma, just like a pneumatic drill or pneumonia. That's the spirit. That's the wind. Somebody that has pneumonia... There's the wind in their lungs. That's where that word comes from. It's our spirit. And so the body, soul, and spirit. And you've got the carnal and the natural and the spiritual. And so we all have to fight every day of our life. Even though we're saved because we're in a physical body with the saved soul and spirit, there is a, a battle. There is a tug of war. There is a war that's, that's raging constantly uh, between our natural man and our spiritual man. A great test of this is how easy it is to do wrong and how hard it is to do right. Here's the test for the spiritual man and the physical man. Is it easier to go shopping or go to a church service? Is it easier to read the Bible or to read articles on the internet or Newsweek or TV Guide or something else? I know people that have read every volume of Harry Potter Front to back, over and over again, those volumes, some of them are 500, 600, 700 pages, Twilight's 900 pages long. I can't read the Bible, Ben, it's just too big, too big a book. You can, but it takes work. You know what's hard to do? Pray. But pray's not, praying's not hard. It's just my flesh don't want to do it. My flesh says, no, don't, why, why would my, what, what's wrong with just talking to God? But my flesh says, oh, you can do that later. Do something else, watch TV. Get you something to eat. Go outside. Let's go somewhere else. Yeah, but I have to be worshiping the Lord. Is it easier to listen to Christian music, worldly music? See, there is a battle between the spirit and the flesh. They're carnal, the natural, the spiritual. And that lines up with gates. I got to stop there. But gates that we've got, we've got an eye gate. We've got an ear gate. We've got a nose gate. We've got a mouth gate. We've got a, a sensation gate. And our information senses through those gates affect us not only physically but spiritually. That's why reading the Word of God is called food. It's called bread. 
And we're not to live by bread alone. That's the physical, but by every word of God. That's the spiritual. We take it in to physically, physical means, but if we process it spiritually, and uh, the things we hear affects us physically and spiritually. The things we do with our body affects us physically or spiritually. Um, so much of that, I mean, even the world, the world talks about alcohol, they call it spirits. You ever notice that? They call it spirits. You know why they call it that? Because when people get drunk, it's like they got a different spirit. That's strange. People that take drugs, it, it changes how they normally would think and act and feel. It alters their sensations. They're not in their right mind. They're not themselves, people will say, because of those, uh, those drugs that alter them. And so they start seeing things and hearing things and, and sensing things because of what's going on. Something taken in their physical body affects their spiritual body, which in turn affects their spiritual body, their physical body as well. So we'll get into that in our next study and, uh, and talk about that. And, uh, you know, that's why when we, we're filled with the Holy Spirit, the Bible compares it to being drunk. You ever notice that? Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Remember Hannah when she's praying? Her lips are moving, but nothing's coming out of her mouth. And the priest says, you're drunk. She said, I I'm not drunk. She said, I'm praying. And so uh, in the early church, when, the, when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, those that were not believers, they confused it with them being drunk. But they're filled with the Spirit. There's a lot of these connections that are there. I deal with the body, soul, and spirit. I think you've got five senses, we know that, but I think when you get saved, you've got an extra one. The Holy Spirit comes in you, and you've got discernment now. You, you've got sensations that are, that are enhanced. Uh, you can sense things and feel things that you couldn't before you got saved. You ever been in a service? We heard it this morning, and uh, uh, one of the ladies, I forget uh, which one was saying it, um, talked about getting goosebumps. I think it was Rachel. She said you heard a song and got goosebumps. You ever heard a Christian song and you feel... What is that? You ever been in a service and feel something inside of you that feels a little different? There, I've been in worship services. I was in one yesterday and Friday night, and just, I mean, some of the songs, the preaching, man, something inside of me almost wanted to bust out of me. You know what that is? That's the spiritual man, the spiritual you, trying to get out of the physical you. But we've got to live with it until Jesus comes or we die. All right, that's all I'll give you tonight. We'll get into it uh, at our next lesson, which um, Wednesday night will be in.